Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, so hello everyone and welcome today's, uh, to today's CAGBC webinar, Fuel Switching Retrofits with Central Air to Water Heat Pumps. My name is Daniel Bode hall and I'm a member and market engagement specialist here at CAGBC. Today we'll be exploring the benefits of air to water heat pumps and how they can be best leveraged to reduce overall building emissions in retrofits of hydronic systems. Today's session is brought to you by Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. Although we're all logging in from different locations, I would like to first begin by acknowledging the land we are on and the communities that have been living on this land since time immemorial. The land I am coming to you from, Ottawa, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inui, and Métis people. If you're interested in learning more about the territory you are coming to us from, we'd encourage you to visit the www.whose.land website. Finally, a few housekeeping notes before we kick off the session. Um, in order to conserve bandwidth, we do ask that you please keep your cameras and microphones off. Um, if you have any questions, please direct them to the chat box. Um, we'll try to strike a balance between keeping some questions for the end uh, for Q&A um, and also asking questions as they're pertinent to this slide and topic that Chris will be on. Um, and just for full disclosure, um, the session is being recorded. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, we're joined today by Chris DeRush, um, who will be leading today's presentation. Chris is a professional engineer and holds a degree in mechanical engineering from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He is the applied product manager um, and is responsible for launching the wide variety of Clima Veneta products and technologies in Canada setting the stage for the next generation of smart, or smart HVAC set solutions. He has a passion for efficient environmental, environmentally responsible HVAC solutions, which will be imperative in the preparation for the future of the built environment as the industry strategizes to meet local and global targets to offset climate change. Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Perfect, thanks Daniel. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to, to join us today to talk about air to water heat pumps. Uh, so just to introduce myself again, I'm Chris Roche, I'm the Applied Product Manager. Um, I, I deal exclusively with our hydronics offerings uh, here at Mitsubishi Electric Canada. Um, and with it being kind of an emerging technology, um, I do a lot of these uh, different types of sessions to talk about the technology very generally and, and how to adapt it into hydronic systems. Um, so certainly today is uh, it, it's a it's a loaded topic to get into in about 40 minutes, which I'll try to do so today. But of course, if anyone has any questions as we go through, feel free to type your question in the chat box. Um, and I'll have my contact information available at the end of the presentation as well, if you'd like to connect and see how this might fit in with uh, some of the work that you're doing. Uh, so I'm going to just shut off my camera as well. I'm working from home today. So I'm uh, going to try to preserve some bandwidth as well to make sure that everything's uh, running smoothly. And I'll just uh, share my screen here and we'll get started. Uh, Daniel, you can see the presentation now? That's correct. It's good, Chris. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Uh, so we will get right into it. All right. Uh, so for the topics for today, uh, we're just going to talk about air to water heat pumps, a technology recap. So we'll talk about what air to water heat pumps are, how they operate, what the constraints are, and how we can work around these constraints to still achieve carbon emission reduction. Um, and then I want to spend some time diving into comparing uh, carbon emissions in hydronic systems for natural gas, electric boilers, and electric heat pumps uh, to demonstrate why this technology will, will be a significant part of, of future HVAC designs when it comes to hydronic systems. Uh, we'll talk about how to compare um, the economic case, so operating costs or carbon savings. Um, and then we'll finish it off with a couple examples of two pipe systems, uh, hybrid four pipe systems, as well as cascade systems for maybe retrofitting some, some high temperature systems. So just in terms of learning objectives, um, there's kind of three key takeaways that I'd like everyone to have at the end of the session today. Um, so the first is I would like, uh, you know, to understand the concept of fuel switching and the importance for high efficiency retrofit of existing building central plant systems. I will point out though that the presentation that we have today, all the concepts that we're gonna talk about in terms of the technology, they apply to both new construction and retrofit. Um, they also apply to commercial or residential systems. I know um, residential air to water heat pumps that do space heating, space cooling, and domestic hot water are uh, becoming an increasingly more popular type of system as well for residential settings. So the concepts that we're gonna talk about will still apply to that, although the examples will be more focused towards commercial systems and large scale central plants. 
Um, we'll talk about maybe some design strategies and how to think about adapting the heat pump into existing systems uh, because it is a different technology. Um, the heat pumps have different limitations in terms of delta T's that they provide. So if you're going to design a, a typical chiller boiler system and then try to drop the heat pump into it, that's not quite going to work out. So we'll talk about some of the some of the more operating considerations as well to take into account throughout the design process. Um, and then again, I just want to recap to have energy and cost savings and emission reductions, how to measure them and how to compare the operating costs for those uh, projects so that we're empowering you guys with the tools to promote this technology to your clients where it is a good fit. So we'll dive right into it. Um, so air to water heat pump, a reversible chiller, a reversible air to water heat pump. Um, there's a lot of misnomers for how we talk about this technology. Um, but kind of the most basic way to explain it is everyone's probably familiar with an air-cooled chiller. This is a device that provides chilled water to a building and it's doing that by using a vapor compression refrigeration cycle in the machine to move heat from one location to another. So our evaporator is providing chilled water to the building. So in order to do this, we're moving heat through the condenser and rejecting that to the atmosphere. In the simplest way, a reversible heat pump, air to water heat pump is that same machine, but with a four-way reversing valve on the refrigerant circuit. And you're just switching uh, what the heat exchanger's functions are. Um, so by redirecting the flow of refrigerant inside the machine, we're actually turning that evaporator in our chiller to a condenser. So we're producing hot water and we're actually rejecting heat to the building. And we're doing that by extracting heat through what's now an evaporator coil on the machine. So it's doing this with a vapor compression refrigeration cycle shown here in heating mode, where we basically put work into a compressor to move heat from one location to another. So basically in order to extract heat from the ambient surroundings, we need to send refrigerant to the outdoor coil that's at a temperature that's colder than whatever the ambient conditions are. So as it gets colder throughout the winter, if we're using this in heating mode, um, as it gets colder, it's gonna start to get harder and harder to extract heat because we need to be sending the refrigerant colder and colder to the evaporator in order to move heat into, um, into the building. So we're gonna see our coefficient of performance and our capacity dropping off as it gets colder, which is one of the key design constraints with the equipment. Um, so we'll talk about that throughout the presentation. Um, but essentially the, the metric that we use to describe any heat pump, not just air to water heat pumps is referred to as the COP. Uh, which is the ratio of the heat output from the machine divided by the power input. Um, so if you're talking in watts per watts, you'll typically talk about COPs in the range of, you know, anywhere from two to four um, at nominal conditions. This type of technology will have a COP somewhere around three. So that means that for three units of energy, um, three, or sorry, for, for one unit of electricity that we're putting into the machine, we're getting three units of heat out from the machine by the COP. So even when the COP is at what would be perceived as its worst COP, which is two, um, that's still two times more efficient than a traditional electric boiler. And we'll talk about that coming up through the presentation as well. Um, so if we have a device that can be a chiller and it can produce hot water, uh, why don't we implement this type of equipment in hydronic systems? So this is uh, going to start us off with the concept of a two-pipe central plant. Um, so this is typical of a condominium application that we'd have in the city of Toronto as an example where I'm presenting from today. Um, typically in a two-pipe system, those systems will have a distribution to go to various air handlers or fan coil units in the building. And it's um, basically in the wintertime, you're running off the boiler. And in the summertime, you're going to shut the boiler off and run off the chiller. Um, so even in the shoulder season, like a day like today, uh, the condo building I'm in right now is a two pipe system and our boilers are still on and it's actually quite a bit warm uh, because the chillers haven't been started up yet. So that's one of the constraints with two pipe systems. Um, but that's inherent to two pipe systems. We'll talk about four pipe systems as well later that provide better indoor comfort. Um, but essentially if we have a type of system that provides cooling in the summer and uh, hot water in the winter, why don't we use an air to water heat pump in those systems? Because for the majority of the year, we can use it as a chiller in the summer and in the winter and the shoulder season, we can use it to provide heating. And in retrofits in particular for two pipe systems, it's a good opportunity because most cases you already have an existing boiler in that system. So uh, there are constraints to the air to water heat pumps that we'll get into in the next slides. Um, and in most cases in Canada, when you're applying this, you'll, you will need a backup heat source, um, but certainly for retrofits, whenever you already have that existing boiler, um, that can provide some advantages. Of course, if you wanted to do a full all electric design as part of the retrofit, um, designers are free to include electric boilers to 
um, have that building at all electric, but that may involve additional capacity upgrades to provide electricity for the boiler, since the boiler only has a COP of one. So whatever the peak heat load is at the worst case coldest condition in winter, we need to make sure that we have um, enough electrical capacity to run that boiler at 100% load. And that's where the air to water heat pump really comes into play because the air to water heat pump is always going to be more efficient than an electric boiler by a factor equal to whatever the COP is. And even at minus 10, um, where you might use this technology to that will still have a COP of you know somewhere around 2.3, 2.4. So it's uh, using 2.4 times less electricity than an electric boiler. But the challenge is it's influenced by outside air temperature, whereas the electric boiler is not. But when we can design around these constraints, we can still see some significant savings and reduce carbon. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go through it. So um, I'm just gonna do a quick recap on the technology constraints with air to water heat pumps. Um, and really the key message that I wanna get across in this slide is uh, understanding how the outside air temperature influences the machine and how to perceive this in the design process is very important to get the maximum results of applying this technology into hydronic systems. And if we can design the building around the heat pump capabilities, um, it's gonna be simpler to adapt. So there's kind of three main um, technological constraints associated with this equipment, and they're all related to uh, the influence of outside air temperature. So the first one is we're going to have a supply temperature that's going to reduce according to the outside air temperature. Um, this is referred to as the operating envelope. The second one is a capacity reduction. So I mentioned this before, as it gets colder outside, it's harder and harder to extract heat. Um, so you're going to have a resulting capacity reduction from that as well. And with the reducing of capacity, and maybe increasing more power to actually extract that heat, you're gonna also run into a decreasing coefficient of performance. So at extremely cold temperatures or coefficient of performance will also be influenced. So the first one, operating envelope. Um, so shown here is an operating envelope that's typical for what you will find on the market for this type of technology, not necessarily from Mitsubishi, but most manufacturers that are providing this type of equipment. At best, you can maybe find something that's maybe minus 20 that can maybe do uh, 45 degrees with vapor injection technology that is available in the market from some manufacturers, but the age old question of the cutout temperature still persists in that case. Um, in Toronto, as an example, our design temperature is minus 23. And usually when you're starting to look at this technology with a design consultant or a building owner, they say, well, what about the cutout temperature? We say, well, our machine cuts out at minus 15. Well, our design temperature is minus 23, so we can't use your unit. And usually my answer to that is, well, you're probably not gonna use it to minus 15 anyway. Um, and that's due to the operating envelope because it's the balance between the supply temperature that we're gonna get from the machine versus the range that we can actually achieve that. So if you look on the Y axis here, we have supply water temperature according to outside air temperature. Um, and, or sorry, on the X axis, we have outside air temperature. So nominally these machines are able to produce 55 degrees Celsius water. Uh, but whenever you look at the operating envelope, it can really only produce that between three degrees and 10 degrees Celsius. So 55 degrees sounds good, but most of the time that we're heating in winter, it's colder than three degrees. We live in Canada. Um, so usually the first design point I usually suggest to engineers to start looking at is designing with a 45 Celsius uh, design temperature on the hydronic side. And that will allow you to use the machines down to minus 10. And this is typical for most manufacturers that you'll see. And that's really just a balance point between having a hot enough temperature that you can get useful heat transfer in a building through existing coils or coils that are retrofit versus the broader range that you can actually operate the machine. As designers, we wanna make sure that we have the same supply temperature available all the time that the machine's intended to run. We don't wanna to have to worry about different loads depending on outside air temperature. And that's why designing with boilers has been very simple um, traditionally. Um, typically for boiler design, you're talking 20 degree Fahrenheit Delta T and for condensing gas boilers, you're designing your system to operate between 140 supply and 120 return. And then you essentially just pick your capacity. But there's a reason why we call it an applied product. Um, it really depends on how you're gonna adapt it into the system. But there's kind of two schools of thought to this. Um, for new construction, you could do a low temperature system design. So that would mean picking heat emitters in the building that have more coil surface area so that you can uh, heat the spaces as needed, even at the extreme limits that you're going to run the heat pump. Because that's really all our heating system is intended to do. It's intended to match the heat loss from the individual spaces in the building. And when we talk about new construction and net zero buildings, um, envelopes are getting a lot tighter in the buildings. So that means that we're reducing the amount of heat that we need to 
replace back into those spaces, um, which means we can downsize our equipment. Um, but also with those heat emitters sized properly, we can make sure that we get the BTUs into the spaces uh, because of those heat emitters, regardless of what the temperature is. In the retrofit world, though, it's a little bit different. And usually that's one of the primary constraints that comes up whenever you're talking to an engineer, because if you want to replace your central plant and maybe operate it at a lower temperature, the perception is that there's the existing coils aren't designed to work with a lower temperature, which is true. But there's another way to look at it is to verify this. And my belief is that uh, perhaps some engineers don't really want to take the risk or look at it, especially if you're talking about a retrofit project where you have scanned copies of drawings, if you're lucky, that are barely legible in terms of the parameters of the coils that are designed in air handlers or fan coil units. But it's important to recognize that whatever supply temperature those coils are designed to, that's really at your worst case design temperature. So minus 23, maybe even colder at minus 30. But most typically we operate boilers off outdoor reset. So as it gets warmer outside, we have less heat losses from the building. So we can actually make it more comfortable by reducing the boiler supply temperature so that on a milder day, you're not blasting out heat from uh, your fan coil unit that's making you uncomfortable. So we can apply the same concept to adapting air to water heat pumps. And one, um, one way to look at the design and what I'd suggest is, you know, site for retrofit, look at what capacity might be available from the coils with using a lower water temperature, maybe down to minus 10, because the hydronic system only needs to match the heat loss at minus 10. And that heat loss is going to be much less at minus 10 than it is at your design day temperature. So oftentimes, if you uh, look into it, you might find that it might be satisfactory to just run it based off this. And we'll talk about on some other slides coming up um, the amount of time that we actually spend between minus 10 and plus 10 for the majority of heating season, even if you're in Calgary, uh, that's still more than 50% of the year. And we'll talk about that coming up. So understanding the operating envelope of the heat pumps and selecting the operating temperature that you're going to operate it at is, is very important to select your heat emitters from that. But also if you're doing a retrofit project where you're going to change out the heat emitters or fan coil units in the building, that's an opportunity to optimize those coils, give them a little bit more surface area so that they're compatible with a heat pump. Uh, the second constraint is the capacity that's going to reduce according to outside air temperature. So this is a heat pump capacity curve. So uh, on the left axis, on the y axis here, we're looking at the heating load and the heating capacity. And on the, on the x axis, we're looking at the outdoor air temperature. So in reality, our design temperature in Toronto is colder than minus 15, it's minus 23 or so, but uh, this technology operates down minus 15. So if you wanted to use the most amount of heat pump possible, um, you could select whatever heating load you have in the building at minus 15, you could choose the number of units or the size to meet that total capacity. Um, but what's going to happen is that's at the point of the heat pump capacity curve where you have the least amount of capacity available from the machine. And the majority in winter, we're spending between minus 10 and plus 10. So usually you have more capacity than what's actually required. And that's why for retrofits especially, it makes sense to look at this technology and size it based off the cooling requirement for the building. And then whatever you get out of it in heating, you get. Certainly you could add more units to meet more of the heating capacity at colder temperatures, but that may result in an imbalance between the peak heating capacity that's available at minus 10 or minus 15 versus the cooling capacity that's available at 35 degrees Celsius. So if you add more units to meet more of the heat load down at minus 10 or minus 15, you might need four units as an example um, to meet the heat load there. But if you're operating at peak cooling, you might only need two or three units. So then the question would be, well, why am I going to buy an extra one or two units just to meet the heat load at this minus 10 or minus 15 that we spend very few hours of the total year actually operating at? So that becomes more of a, a capital cost consideration more than anything. Um, but certainly if you're doing a net zero project, you, you will need that auxiliary boiler for those few hours where it's minus 20 or minus 25, um, but you're running it for a few hours of the total time. So but the main point is when a manufacturer provides you rating for this type of equipment, they're going to base it off the HRI 550 conditions. And it's important that you actually specify the conditions and understand the operating envelope so that you can pick your supply temperature and then determine which outside air temperature you're actually going to run the machine down to. Because at standard AHRI conditions, that's where you're kind of exiting heating season. And that's where you have the most capacity available from a machine versus uh, the smallest 
amount of heating load that's actually required. So certainly if this was tied into domestic hot water to do domestic hot water preheat, working with in the heat pumps limitations, that could be a good way to offload the available capacity. And especially if that domestic hot water system's operating uh, with natural gas, you could still um, operate off the heat pump for most of the water. And then the boiler only needs to take the water up from maybe 40 degrees to 60 degrees Celsius. And we'll have an example of that coming up later as well. So um, it's important to distinguish between application rating conditions and the AHRI standard rating conditions. But um, one benefit that you can do to optimize the sizing and also simplify the design based off the operating envelope is by choosing what's called a bivalence point. So bivalence just means you have two energy sources. So in this example, it's showing the heat pump and an auxiliary boiler. So essentially you can downsize the initial machine sizing and optimize the economics of it a little bit by, by recognizing that whenever you need the least amount of heat load is where you have more capacity. Um, and whenever you look at the weather data, which we'll have coming up on the next slide, this provides also a good happy medium between equipment sizing versus uh, the range of temperatures where you're actually going to run it. And then you just simply switch over to the auxiliary boiler. If you did want to meet um, with the heat pump, if, if your heat pump curve is providing this area under the curve here, um, if your temperatures are the same in the hydronic system, this part still could be used with the heat pump working with the boiler and the boiler is kind of filling in the main capacity. But you also need to look at the temperatures as well in those instances. So in this example, your application rating conditions would become the bivalence point as well, shown here at about minus seven degrees Celsius. So the third constraint that we have is the coefficient of performance, which is correlated to capacity. And if you plotted capacity, it would look very similar to these curves. Um, so on the left axis here, I'm showing the bin hours. So this is weather data downloaded from Environment Canada. And this is actually a four-year average now. Um, the data I've been collecting over the years goes from started in April 2018 and that goes till March 22. So there's basically four winter seasons that are included in this data. And even over the last winter that we just had in Toronto, you know, I felt like it was much colder winter. And whenever I looked at the data, it wasn't um, too much worse than the winter that we had in 2018. So kind of 2018 and 2022 were a bit colder winters and 2019 and 2020 were a little bit milder. Even last year, uh, based off the Toronto data in 2021, there was only one hour where it was colder than minus 15. So we have the perception that, okay, well, Canada is very cold and it is in some places like Calgary, but um, in some places it's not. And we can still see some significant savings between minus 10 and plus 10. That's good heat pump weather. So this on the right axis here, we're looking at our coefficient of performance and we have different curves based off the water temperature. So another important consideration, if we're looking at the operating envelope, if we wanna maximize the amount of time the heat pump can run, we want to design with the coldest water temperature possible because even if our system's designed with uh, to work with heat emitters say at 40 degrees celsius even though at you know one degree celsius the machine could provide water as high as 50 degrees by maintaining a lower water temperature we're increasing the efficiency as well so we can see this if we look at zero degrees as an example if we compare 45 degrees celsius leaving water temperature at zero degrees which is kind of an average winter day uh, our COP would be 2.8. But if we design our system to work with 40 degree water instead, so drop that by five degrees C, we can increase the COP by 10%. Um, and then if we go to 35, which really might be only suitable for in floor radiant systems, that number goes up to another 10% to 3.4. So not only are you increasing the efficiency that the machine's gonna operate at, but you're also expanding the range where you can actually use it. So this is kind of also showing you the operating envelope that we looked at, at at one of the first sections here. So 55 is really only showing you able to achieve that between three and 10. With 50 degrees, you can operate as high as 23 and as low as minus six. And then that 45 degrees we were talking about, minus 10, which covers off a significant portion of the hours. Um, so I wanna go through uh, some different climates uh, throughout Canada that are kind of best case to worst case in terms of hours, because um, even if you're talking about Calgary, you're still talking more than 50% of the total year, we're spending between minus 10 and plus 10. Um, and if we want to implement this type of technology, we will need an auxiliary heat source in most cases, and that's just gonna run as a function of however many hours it's colder than minus 10. But if we look in Vancouver, which is very much a heat pump market, uh, they're kind of eliminating natural gas boilers and even backup electric boilers in some cases for new buildings coming out because they have a little bit more of a favorable climate. 
Um, but if we look in Vancouver, the times where it's below minus 10, uh, four-year average, there was only five years where it was colder than minus 10. On average, though, 50.5%, over 4,400 hours in Vancouver. If we go to Halifax, where it's still a little bit milder, okay, in the wintertime, sometimes based off, you know, whatever the average is over the last couple, couple of years, times below minus 10, you're talking 3% of the year, but still 56% of the year, you're spending between minus 10 and plus 10, where it's, again, good heat pump weather. Uh, similar Toronto, 52% with 2.3% where it's colder than minus 10. Um, so shown here, relatively fewer hours where your backup heat source is running. Montreal, you start getting a little bit colder, but still 50.1%. You're spending between minus 10 and plus 10. Um, and a little bit more time that you're spending below minus 10, 6.7%. So that just means you're running your backup boiler, electric or natural gas for more of the time. And then if we look at Calgary, which is maybe an extreme example, uh, we're talking 871 hours, so about 10% where we're colder than minus 10, but 52% of the hours we're spending between minus 10 and plus 10, and we still need to heat during those times. So it's with heat pumps, it's not about all or nothing. It's about using it within the limitations when it makes sense to do so, um, and you can still have some considerable savings. And we'll talk about that more from the carbon and operating perspective as well coming up. Uh, so I just had a summary slide here of kind of the, the same values that we just went over, but you know, even from best case to worst case, we're talking over 50% on average. So we need to leverage that a bit more. Uh, so moving on to the next session section, I just want to talk about COP of different heating technologies. Uh, because if we're using hydronic systems in our buildings, and if we're doing retrofits, and we want to reuse the existing piping in the building, if we want to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in that building, then that means we essentially need to get rid of the natural gas boiler. And really the technologies that are available to replace that, your choices are essentially an electric boiler, which always has a COP of one. So you put one unit of electricity into it, you get one thermal kilowatt hour out. Or an air to water heat pump where you put one unit of electricity in and you get anywhere from two to four units of heating out to provide the same thermal kilowatt hour provided to the building. For the natural gas boiler, it's actually a COP less than one. Even if you have a condensing gas boiler, that's anywhere from 95 to 98% efficiency, depending on the return temperature going back to the boiler, you're actually gonna divide that by 0.98 and you'll have to use a little bit more natural gas to provide the same thermal kilowatt hours. So if we want to decarbonize existing hydronic systems, it's clear that air to water heat pumps will have some role in, in helping decarbonize those buildings. Um, so different markets though require different solutions and the different markets have different um, climates that we need to take into account when we're designing for buildings and different markets get their electricity from different sources that really affect the viability from both an economic and a greenhouse gas emission point of view to actually be able to reduce emissions. So if we look at this chart here in green, this is supposed to show the emissions intensity per uh, kilowatt hour of electricity. So if we want to compare this from a thermal point of view, we're going to assume that natural gas is operating at 100% efficiency, and we're going to assume that we have a COP of one so that we're comparing apples to apples. But if we look in Alberta, it's actually more emissions to use electric heat than it is to just burn natural gas at the building. This does not take into account the COP from the heat pump. So if you're talking about a, a heat pump COP anywhere from two to four, then if you have a very high COP of about four, um, that would make it more energy friendly than natural gas. But in the times where it's colder, you're actually producing more emissions. But obviously in places like Alberta, Nova Scotia, and Saskatchewan, this will be improving over time as uh, the electricity that's being produced is transitioned towards cleaner sources, incorporating uh, wind power and solar power. Um, so that will definitely influence it. But if you look at some of the more uh, green electricity markets like BC, Quebec, Ontario, uh, running a heat pump emits significantly less emissions than a natural gas boiler that's producing that same amount of heat on site. Um, and just to compare this, what I did was I took a COP from a heat pump, um, taking into account the COP from minus 10 to about 30 degrees Celsius, and then normalized the emissions of providing the same amount of heat from a boiler to a natural gas boiler. And whenever you normalize it to the heat pumps emissions, you can express how much more emissions an electric boiler produces compared to the heat pump or natural gas. So based off the values for Ontario, 
natural gas is basically 12 to 23 times more efficient for that same amount of heat that's provided from the heat pump. So at a minimum, when our COP is at its lowest value at minus 10, it's still 12 times more emissions by using natural gas. And whenever it's warmer outside and it's easier to extract heat from the environment, that number goes up to 23 times. And that's because Ontario has a relatively clean power grid. If we look at BC, BC has a, an even cleaner electricity grid. Um, we're talking about 18 grams of uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour. So this number essentially doubles to the previous one. Um, so even when the COP from the heat pumps at its worst, it's 25 times more emissions. And when it's warmer, 47 times. If we move on to look at Quebec, where it's an even cleaner energy market, virtually emissions free, uh, 1.2 grams of CO2 equivalent emissions per kilowatt hour. Um, doing the same analysis, you can't really see the lines anymore for the electric boiler, or electric heat pump. Um, but we're seeing that it's 360 to 700 times less emissions. And this explains why Quebec is uh, an electrically heated dominant market. And that's a good thing for heat pumps because that means a lot of buildings already have enough capacity to provide that um, thermal load to the building to adapt it to heat pumps. Um, so the last part I wanted to cover off on this is we can look at the carbon side of it to how much emissions we're going to reduce by using a heat pump or an electric boiler over a conventional natural gas, but how do we compare the operating costs? So similarly, if we were looking at one thermal kilowatt hour provided from either a boiler or a heat pump, it's the same thermal kilowatt hour that's provided from the building. So if we want to look at what the electric heat pump is, we can take whatever dollars per kilowatt hour of electricity that we're paying for and divide it by the COP. That's how much we're paying for one thermal kilowatt hour from the heat pump. And if we look at the boiler, if we take our dollars per kilowatt hour natural gas, we have to convert our cubic meters of natural gas to kilowatt hours. And we divide that by the boiler efficiency of you know, 0 0.95, 0 0.8 for an older boiler. Um, that's how much we're paying for that same thermal kilowatt hour provided from the boiler. And if we rearrange that equation, we can figure out what's our break even COP if we wanna find out purely on operating costs, what we need uh, the price prices to be for the two fuels to break even. We can rearrange this equation. And what's interesting though, is when you express that in terms of the ratio between uh, dollars per kilowatt hour electricity and dollars per kilowatt hour natural gas, you can plot that for various boiler efficiencies. And that's what it would look like here. Um, so essentially what you would do is plot this equation depending on whatever boiler efficiency you're talking about. So if you have a relatively new boiler, it's probably 95% efficient. Or if you're talking about a retrofit, um, then you'll have some significant heat pump savings. And then maybe as part of that project as well, you'll retrofit that old atmospheric boiler to a high efficiency condensing boiler as well. Um, but if you just look at your natural gas or your electricity bill, I'd encourage everyone just to look at the total distribution charges um, and find out just the total pre-tax amount on the bill and divide it by the total amount of natural gas usage to figure out your true delivered rate. And you would also need to express um, repeat the same exercise in terms of electricity. Now, what's not included in here is any additional charges that would be incorporated with the heat pump in order to, um, like there's a demand charge as well that you'd have based off how many kilowatts you're using instantaneously on peak, things like that. So this is not taken into account in this, um, but it's important to look at both electricity and natural gas, your total delivered price. So if you figure out your pricing in this example here, the ratio came out uh, based off 35 cents per cubic meter natural gas and 12 cents for electricity. Um, number came out to 3.46. So basically what you do is you draw a horizontal line at uh, on the price ratio on the y-axis here. And then where it intersects with the boiler efficiency that you're looking at, you just look down and figure out what that break-even COP is required. So based off these price ratios, if you're comparing it to a 95% efficient boiler, then if you want to be operating it off economics, you would need a COP of 3.25 to break even. So that means you could go back and look at your uh, COP curve that I showed a couple slides ago and where it's 3.25, anywhere where it's warmer than that, you know you're gonna make money and it's gonna be cheaper to operate the heat pump. And if you're to the left of that, you're gonna be spending more money to operate the heat pump. But really what's important is to look at the total year and look at how those savings average out if we're purely focused on the economics. Similarly, if we're looking at an 80% boiler, instead of a 3.25, we need somewhere around uh, 2.7 or so to be economical. So 
there's a couple different ways of looking at it, so it's important. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about in this section is the carbon tax. As we know, we've been seeing that. Um, you know, the current carbon tax scheme has basically been seeing the price go up by $10 per year. Uh, so on April 1st, just a couple days ago, we saw the price go up by essentially two cents. I'm rounding it off here. Um, but basically, we've been seeing the price of natural gas per cubic meter go up by two cents year over year. Now, the federal government still needs to implement the enhanced plan that they announced in December of 2020 that would see the price going up to $170 per ton. Um, but it's just a matter of having that passed in legislation. And, you know, we're even hearing from other presenters with the Canada Green Building Council that are talking about the government using a kind of a shadow price of $300 per ton as well. Um, we're not going to get into that really, but the point I want to make on this slide here is that once the new tax that's going to see the increase of price go up by $15 per year, not 10, that's going to translate into three cents year over year of an increase for pricing. So even if you look at the period from 2023 to 2030, that's eight years times three cents increase per year is 24 cents of an increase by 2030. And if our price for natural gas is anywhere between 25 to 35 cents now, essentially it's going to double. Um, but it's also important if you're looking at new construction, if you're starting design of a new project, that building's not going to go into operation for three or four years or more in some cases. So it's also important to look at what the energy prices are going to be long term when making the decision, because the prices we have today won't be reflective of what it will be in uh, three or four years from now. Um, so that's all I really wanted to talk about through uh, with the carbon tax and comparing operating costs and uh, the technological constraints of the heat pump. So as you can see, there's a lot of good reasons why we would want to still look to designing as much as we can with the air to water heat pumps to get the most benefit. Um, so I'm going to try to finish up here in the next 10 minutes to have time for questions. So I just have uh, some different examples that we'll go through. Um, so a typical two pipe changeover system. Um, this might be a system where you'd have you know, however many units you're going to size it either based off cooling or based off heating. Um, but just to illustrate it, you know, based off these machines will stage during summer, depending on the building load. So at nighttime, when it's a bit cooler, you may not need to be running all three. Uh, maybe two units are running and the third one will shut off. Um, but whenever you're going to switch over that plant, normally a two pipe changeover building has a three way valve to switch between the boiler and the chiller. Um, so you can still take advantage of that in a two pipe system. And whenever you turn them into heating mode, you would run one, two, three machines, depending on the load, similar to cooling uh, to meet your heating load. But because you have the auxiliary backup boiler, it's just a matter of integrating that within the controls and switching over that valve whenever you do need to run off the auxiliary boiler for maybe those very, very cold days. So what this looks like in terms of a retrofit. Um, so this is a project that we're uh, working on with a customer for uh, equipment that's going to be installed this fall. Uh, where they basically needed a uh, chiller to be replaced at the building. So it was 110 tons. Um, and very forward thinking condo corporation, you know, they saw the potential of rather than replace this like for like, let's upgrade it to a heat pump, size it for cooling, whatever we get out of it and heating we get, but that's able to offset the greenhouse gas emissions of the condo corporation and future proofing the building. So in this case, they already had existing boilers. Um, and this is able to provide them dual fuel system to have a bit more flexibility to run based off operating costs or based off lower carbon footprint as well and still have that backup boiler that we were talking about. So basically they're replacing it like for like. So instead of that chiller, they're using two heat pumps that are going to operate to provide heating uh, when feasible. And based off doing a bin hour analysis that I won't, uh, I don't have time to get into the details right now, um, but this is just comparing the heat pump operating at 45 degrees Celsius, which is how we size it in this instance, so that it was able to run all the time down to minus 10. And just comparing that to the boilers and the amount of emissions that they would produce also operating with a 45 degrees Celsius supply. Um, so the savings based off the bin hours and taking into account the efficiency of the heat pump and the emissions intensity of uh, natural gas versus electricity basically came out to be 118 tons of savings. And just to kind of put this in perspective with the carbon tax, it's gonna see a shift in price over time 2022, the price is $50 per ton. So in 2022, with that tax, it's $6,000 savings per year. Um, by 2030, when it's $170 per ton, we're talking $20,000 savings per year. So if we look at the cumulative savings, by the end of this decade, as the carbon tax matures, it's going to be $120,000 savings. So those savings can quickly pay back for the cost of, of the upgrade to the heat pump over what the cost of a traditional chiller would have been.
Um, similarly, another project, I alluded to this before as well. Um, this was an application for a project that didn't actually end up going ahead, um, but I want to illustrate kind of the sizing and why it's important to design around the heat pump. Um, so there was a project where the system was designed with boilers and chillers. Um, so they had an 80 ton condensing unit with an evaporator and two heating boilers at 140 kilowatts each. Um, so we said, well, okay, based off your design, we would size the heat pump down to maybe minus 10, minus five. Uh, in this particular case, the engineer wasn't able to change all the heat emitters to accommodate 45 C, but they said, you know what, we can live with a 50 degree Celsius supply which our machines could provide down to minus five degrees Celsius. Again, taking into account the capacity that you want to meet of the coils in the building um, because you're, all you're trying to do is match the heat loss. So we propose use two 40 ton units, just size them for cooling, whatever you get out of the heating you get. Um, and what did that look like? Well, based off the conditions for the heat pumps, they're 40 tons nominal cooling, but in heating based off needing 50 degrees Celsius supply that they could be operated down to minus five. Each machine provided 107 kilowatts. So from heat pumps down to minus five, at least there was 215 kilowatts at a minimum. Keep in mind that as it gets warmer outside, you have more capacity available from the heat pumps. So maybe at five degrees, you could actually only run one unit to meet the total heat load of the building and, and save energy that way as well. But compared to the heating boilers of 280 kilowatts, 75% of the heating capacity could be provided from the heat pumps down to minus five. And it's important to remember this curve, it's arbitrary in this case, but your coldest design day temperature is where you need 100% of the load. And as it gets warmer, you have less heat losses, so you don't actually need it. So in most cases, this can be more than adequate. And in this case, it made a lot of sense um, because they would just size it based off the cooling. And you may have noticed that I haven't really talked about cooling during the presentation because in terms of temperatures, delta Ts, um, it's all basically the same as existing chillers. So really the air to water heat pumps, just a, a chiller plus. And, and that's really how we need to think about it rather than focusing on meeting more of the capacity at colder temperatures. There's, there's a happy medium and a holistic approach that needs to be taken if we wanna see some immediate savings to greenhouse gas emissions now, rather than wait for technology to, to come that's maybe five, 10 years away to be able to operate it down to minus 30. Or of course for new construction, there's other choices in the market as well. And this type of equipment is, is best suited for retrofits, can be a little bit challenging. You can use it on new construction, but rather than have the auxiliary boiler, why not design the whole building with VRF, right? So, I mean, this is why uh, engineers go through the design process and different clients have different requirements and different budgets as well. So there's different solutions for, for different problems. I um, just want to talk quickly about four pipe systems. So rather than um, a two pipe system, most modern systems are four pipe because uh, in some fashion we need heating and cooling available year round. Four pipe systems, essentially just two, two pipe systems stacked, one dedicated for hot water, one dedicated for chilled water. Um, so what we wanted to do was understand how air to water heat pumps would fit into a two pipe system and we, we took from ASHRAE 90.1, a typical air-cooled chiller boiler plant and tried to adapt two pipe units into it and quickly found out that there was too many unmet hours where the dehumidification loads weren't able to be met throughout uh, the entire year. So the solution that we actually came up with, and we see this on projects often in BC, is uh, to use three-way valves on the inlet and outlet of each unit so that each machine can independently operate to meet the cooling load or the heating load. Um, and again, because you need an auxiliary boiler in most cases, an auxiliary boiler is included in the system and the general control strategy is to stage the units to meet the cooling requirement in the building. Any units that don't need to operate in cooling can be staged to heating to offset any boiler usage. And then the boiler simply meets up the difference. Uh, so if we look at our average um, peak loads uh, from the energy modeling that we did on this, um, it makes sense that at minus 19, you really don't have much of a cooling requirement um, for a large hotel building was the application. Um, you start requiring some cooling for dehumidification and space cooling around 10 degrees or so. And that's where you have the least amount of, of hot water um, being required in the system. And we still have a little bit, and that's really just for a reheat strategy uh, if we're talking about hydronic system. 
I should also point out that this does not include uh, domestic hot water that was excluded to simplify the analysis, but certainly in this range where we only have a small amount of heating capacity required, we, we would definitely want to couple that to domestic hot water preheat at least to be able to offload any excess capacity available from the machine if we're going to run it anyway, rather than cycling it on and off at low, low periods. So this actually ended up being quite a nifty application and we took a deep dive into the loads uh, throughout the year. So I'll just try to go through this uh, pretty quickly and finish up here, but on the cooling side, so the dark blue line is showing the peak cooling demand from the building and the blue bar is showing the capacity available based off the peak monthly temperature of cooling whenever you stage all three units in cooling in this example. So this is shown here not meeting this because this is essentially the difference between a calculated peak from the energy modeling and this bar is actually talking about the available capacity assuming an average um, peak temperature but in reality um, whenever you're looking at the heating or the cooling the peak heating doesn't occur at the same time as the peak cooling but essentially from January where we don't have any cooling load we stage all the machines into heating in February we don't need any cooling so we stage all those in heating still and then in March and April we start to get into the shoulder season where maybe there's some warmer days and maybe there's some cooler days and it's important to note that you know the peak cooling doesn't occur at the same time as the peak heating so in reality this is showing two units in heating and one in cooling and we're not meeting our peak heating load, but really we don't need the cooling all the time at the same instance. So in reality, this would meet up with this point. So the general strategy is to follow the cooling loads, whatever units are available to be staged into uh, heating or set into heating to offset any boiler usage. And then the auxiliary boiler just ma makes up any difference. But it's important to recognize that your building load is dynamic. So the heat pumps are also dynamic. So when you take this into account in the design process, you'll find that you can actually meet the heating and cooling loads throughout the year and save a lot of energy and carbon emissions while doing so. Um, so what we did was we looked at uh, ASHRAE 90.1 building from 90.1 2004 uh, with the assumption of, okay, this chiller is at the end of its life cycle. So rather than replace it like for like, let's upgrade it to an air to water heat pump and what do those savings look like? Um, so in Vancouver, we sized it for 48 degree supply because the design temperature there was minus seven. Toronto and Montreal ended up being very similar where uh, the heat pumps were only sized to work down to minus 10 with that 45 degree Celsius supply. But overall, what we saw was about a, over 20% on average for the energy use intensity reduction and about a 50% reduction in natural gas in Toronto, 55 in Vancouver, and about 42% in Montreal. Um, we're showing here reduction in electricity as a negative. Obviously, that's due to the fuel switching, so we're adding electricity to it um, for that portion of it. So that's important to consider as well. But uh, generally, if we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking for Toronto and Montreal. They were very similar. Um, so the savings were, were pretty similar between Toronto and Vancouver, about 40%. And in Vancouver, the auxiliary boiler was actually completely eliminated. And then in terms of natural gas use of kilowatt hours per square meter, Vancouver is about a 55% reduction and then 50% in uh, Toronto and 42% Montreal, like we talked about before. Um, on, the operate, on the first cost side and, and carbon tax, like we look at for the two pipe example as well, um, if we look at the total amount of carbon that was offset from this energy modeling, on average, we're about 200 tons per year. Um, but just a simple calculation kind of on the back of the napkin, if we look at a standard air cool chiller, that cost to the owner might be around 1200 bucks per ton. Uh, for air to water heat pumps, that price is a little bit higher. Uh, so around maybe $2,000 per ton. So what's the incremental cost of the upgrade? This doesn't include any heat exchangers additionally that might be needed for integration or anything like that. But just to kind of put it in perspective, if we look at an incremental cost of $800 per ton of a 175 ton system, you know, that's somewhere around $150,000 for the equipment cost. Well, what about the carbon tax and the amount of savings just by implementing, um, you know, a small step in, in the right direction? Uh, as the rising carbon tax goes up to $170 per ton, we're talking over $200,000 savings. So it's worth a closer look on projects and, you know, just because of a lot of the constraints around the technology and the cutout temperature that we talked about before, often in the design process, the technology kind of gets dismissed perhaps a little bit too quickly. So 
I hope uh, throughout the presentation today that everyone um, was able to learn more about the technology and understand how to work around the constraints. Um, just the last uh, two, yeah. I was just gonna suggest uh, we take a couple Question. of questions, but yeah, um, sure. okay, so we have no one. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, here, um, what's the current data on augmenting the heat pumps operating range by placing it in a solar mechanical room that can absorb solar heat gains and therefore create a milder source environment for the heat pump. Can this become a good practice for air to water heat pumps? Uh, yeah, so in British Columbia, oftentimes in the parkades, we see heat pumps. Uh, the VRF condensers are one example of that, that are a little bit smaller and more of a modular system, and those are definitely going in parkades. I've seen this type of air-to-water heat pump being installed even in parkades in uh, like the exhaust shafts as well. So any exhaust air from the garage is being, having the heat extracted from that. Usually the constraint is having enough static pressure from the fans on the machines to do it. But yeah, that, that's a good application because you can essentially raise the uh, ambient temperatures and boost the COP for sure. Especially if that energy is coming from solar, then you're not paying or moving that heat into the space just to have it heated down, cool down with the heat pump, right? Right. And in sort of this uh, similar vein, um, in colder climates, can heat exchangers be used uh, for rejected air to preheat air for the air to water heat pumps to improve efficiency, um, lowering efficient range uh, for outdoor air temperature? How would such a how would such a system be configured? Uh, that's a good question. I'd have to I'm not sure I'm understanding quite exactly the application, but uh, just in terms of using hydronics from an exhaust airstream to a supply airstream. That's one application that we do see heat pumps quite often in, uh, sometimes referred to as a runaround recovery circuit. Um, obviously implementing like uh, energy recovery ventilation, either uh, cores or enthalpy wheels is, is a good way to also recover heat. It really depends on the existing configuration. Um, but that that's one way where if you're just extracting heat from an exhaust airstream that's you know maybe 20 degrees then you don't need a very high temperature on the heat pump to actually extract heat from that so that's that's a good application as well okay and are there any problems um surrounding the frosting on the evaporator um like when a heat pump's operating between minus five and plus five are there any significant performance losses uh yes there are uh, heat pump performance losses. So uh, this is due to defrost. So the evaporator coil on the machine is very, very cold. Um, and if you have humid air going over that, you'll get frost developing on it. And in heat pump equipment, we have what's called the defrost cycle. So even though the machine's supposed to be in heating, we actually briefly turn it into cooling. So that becomes a condenser and the hot gas and the coil melts all the frost and ice, and then it switches back into heating mode. Um, under the AHRI standard conditions, defrosting or the penalty that you're paying for that isn't actually accounted for it in the test standard. Uh, so whatever you are working with the manufacturer, you can ask them for the EN14511 ratings, and that's the European standard that does take that into account. Um, but you can expect about 10% less capacity. So um, there's one project where the engineer asked for this on and at minus 10, we had about 550 MBH. And then he asked the same question. We rated it to the other standard and that decreased it to 500 MBH. So about 10% decrease. And uh, at Mitsubishi, we have the software to do that either way as you like, but that's one thing where you can size it in accordance with the European standard. And then you know that you're gonna be covered even taking into account worst case, but it's really based off humidity and not necessarily temperature. So if there's certain climates where it's very dry and you don't see a lot of defrosting and others that's very humid, even during the winter down to minus five where they'll be defrosting more. Great, thanks Chris. Um, and do you have any comment on the global warming potential of refrigerants used in heat pumps, air to water heat pumps with or water circulations versus VRF, for example, um, and including in this conversation, uh, the planning for heat pump retrofits? Uh, that's a really good question. So embodied carbon is becoming uh, a very important topic these days. The one benefit to this technology over distributed systems like VRF is that you typically have lower refrigerant charge. So if you're looking at a VRF system currently using 410A, depending on the pipe length, you need to provide enough refrigerant in that system to maintain your head pressure to actually get the system to operate. 
Um, so you're going to use more refrigerant than you would with what's referred to as monoblock with the air to water heat pumps that are outside. So out of, from the, from the get go, you're using less refrigerant, uh, with the monoblock heat pump and keep in mind as well, even with this technology, there's next generation refrigerants that are going to be coming to market as well. Uh, like in Italy, like that's the factory that I deal with. It's a European product. <clears throat> They already have the same product developed with R454B, which is a lower GWP. The problem is those refrigerants right now, we're still analyzing the safety aspect of it in North America um, because they're A2L refrigerants, so they're mildly flammable. But that will definitely have a part in this technology moving forward. And I think after 2025 in Canada, it's going to be there's going to be more clarity in the market as to whether or not the new refrigerants can be used for either VRF or monoblock heat pumps outside. However, the benefit of the A2L refrigerants with the monoblock heat pump is if you did have a leak from the heat pump, you're not um, that refrigerant is not going to go into an occupied space. It's going to it's not good for the environment, but doesn't pr present the same life safety concerns that a distributed system might. OK, great. Um, and we'll try to answer one or two more questions. Um, so someone was interested in the ability to use an air to water heat pump um, bridged with a thermal storage, uh, for example, a very large water storage tank um, in order to act as a flexible load, which can consume during periods of either low electricity pricing or periods where the marginal grid emissions are low to zero. Are there any capabilities there in your opinion? Yeah, so that's actually a requirement that comes up with air to water heat pumps in retrofit cases, even that Toronto condo example I mentioned earlier, um, when you're doing the fuel switching, typical two pipe systems in Toronto don't actually have buffer tanks for the chillers or the boilers. And that's a requirement when you're adding the heat pumps to prevent short cycling of the machine. So that provides uh, some energy storage for the heat pumps. And whenever we were looking at the data, you know, just remembering off the top of my head for Vancouver, there was five hours where it was colder than minus 10 for that cutout temperature. One strategy that they could certainly implement is to add energy storage. Um, and you, you, you can oversize the buffer tanks and be a bit more generous. Um, that's not a problem. You don't want to oversize them too much, um, but there's a happy medium from it, depending on if it's a two pipe changeover system. Um, but that's a strategy to save energy and you could use it to save energy costs um, as the person suggested with uh, maybe charging that when electricity is at its lowest price and, and offloading it whenever it's at higher prices. But again, those like few hours below the minus 10 cutout, it's not like you have two weeks straight where it's minus 20. It's typically a few hours in the middle of the night here and there between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. So that's definitely a strategy that should be implemented and in, in increasing the, the storage capacity of that to be able to meet it without even needing to run the heat pumps during those periods. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I think that was a great presentation. And just based on the number of questions, um, it seems like everyone's really interested in the topic. Really appreciate you coming. Well, joining yeah. us, not coming by. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk about heat pumps. So uh, my contact information is up on the screen here. So if anyone has any uh, questions or uh, the person who asked the question about uh, the indoor, uh, there's one of them. I wasn't sure about all the details. If you want to send me those questions, I'd be happy to touch base with anyone and, and talk heat pumps. Uh, it's also interesting to talk to people about the different applications to, to, to define the problems that need to be solved with this. It's, it's called an applied product. There's a thousand different ways you can use it. So it's always interested in hearing from the market uh, to see the types of problems that you need solutions for. Awesome. I'm just going to throw up our screen for a second. Um, so with that, uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks again to Mitsubishi Electric Sales for sponsoring today's session and Chris for hosting. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that Building Lasting Change is making its in-person return this year. Um, the conference will run from June 1st to 3rd at the Beanfield Centre in downtown Toronto. We're excited to welcome everyone back for three days of engaging keynotes, presentations, panel discussions, uh, case studies, and plenty of in-person networking. Registration is now open, and I encourage you all to save your spot as soon as possible. There are still sponsorship opportunities available, so if you are interested, um, please reach out to myself or another member of the client experience team. Um, we also have an event coming up next week uh, in our innovation series. It's going to return for a case study on CIBC Square, uh, which is one of the new AAA office tower developments in Toronto. The session will explore the project's various green building features and explore how they manage to align sustainability with the personal well-being of its occupants to greatly enhance the end user's experience. 
Finally, thanks to everyone in the audience who's still with us. Um, really appreciate you taking the time today and attending today's CHBC webinar. Um, and we hope to see you in person at the conference in June. Um, thanks again, Chris. It was a great presentation. And right, um, thank you. we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, Daniel.